from the ABC 27 Stormtrack Center, it's time to go beyond the forecast. Well, welcome to March and welcome to another edition of Beyond the Forecast. With severe weather season right around the quarter, we want to get you ready for what Mother Nature has in store. Yeah, you know the drill by now. This time of the year, it's the clash of the last gasps of winter's chill versus the growing warmth of the spring season. When the two come together, it can stir up strong thunderstorms and occasionally even tornadoes. This episode of Beyond the Forecast will examine how these storms sometimes grow into giants and we'll show you the data that argues there is one part of our region that sees more tornadoes than the rest. Let's get things started. That's right. Well, we normally see a few tornadoes in south central Pennsylvania every spring and summer. Most of what we see are EF0 and EF1 tornadoes with wind speeds between 65 to 110 miles per hour. But there has been some powerful tornadoes occur in Pennsylvania, some of which affected the mid-state. Meteorologist Eric Finkenbinder shows us just how many tornadoes we've seen throughout the years and some of the recent memorable ones. Well, we may not be in Tornado Alley, but our state has had our fair share of tornadoes. In a normal year, we average about 10 tornadoes across the state of Pennsylvania. Just locally, we have seen a variety over the last couple of years. For example, last year, we only had about three tornadoes. Where the year before that, in 2011, 12 tornadoes. Many of us can remember several of those tornadoes uh, that touched down across the mid-state. Now, when you tally up all of the tornadoes since we've been keeping records all the way through 2009, each county has had at least several tornadoes, but we do have two maximums across this state. One which occurs in our region and another one which seems to really be pulled a bullseye across the western half of the state. But notice Adams, York, Lancaster and Lebanon counties also have a fair number of tornadoes uh, since we've been keeping records. Now when you take these tornadoes and you put it in a graph, notice the months that we see most of them occur during the month of May, June and July. But June and July seem to have the most and seem to have F one tornadoes quite frequently. That's what you see indicated there on the red bars. Now the strongest tornadoes F4 and F5 is the only time they have occurred across the state was during the months of May and June. What about the time of day? Well, the best time to see them is 3 o'clock in the afternoon till about 6 o'clock in the evening. If you notice, we have had most of our tornadoes 108 between the hours of 3 and 4 and also between four and five seem to be the peak, and then they begin to tail off as we head later in the evening. Now, some of the stronger tornadoes within the last 10 years have occurred during this time. For example, many of us remember the Campbelltown tornado in Lebanon County, which occurred July 14th, 2004, an F3, a strong F3 tornado with wind speeds of 175 to 200 miles an hour. We may also remember the Halifax tornado, a rare December tornado, which occurred, uh, occurred on the 1st of December 2006, which was an F1 with wind speeds of 100 to 110 miles an hour. And also the tornado outbreak, which occurred in 2011, which uh, really set, produced several EF1 tornadoes anywhere from Franklin to Cumberland, Perry and Dolphin counties. Brett, Ryan. You know, Brett, it really goes to show you last year, not so many tornadoes. The year before, I think we were up near a dozen. So the numbers can vary every year. I mean, we're even getting activity into December. So. That's right. And it's very active in the spring. But July, like Fink said, actually the month where we see the most typically. Yeah, it, it's a bit surprising because that's not necessarily when we see that, that convergence of cold and warm air. But that's at right. the same time, it, it can happen. Yeah. yeah, good information. Yeah, absolutely. Well, coming up later on Beyond the Forecast, we head to Lancaster County to talk with meteorologists at Millersville University about severe weather hotspot in southeastern Pennsylvania. That's right, but up next, I talk with a meteorologist from the Storm Prediction Center in Oklahoma about the difficulties of predicting severe weather and what he sees on the horizon for the spring. Also coming up, Dan gets sciency with a lesson on how a spring day can go from sunny and pleasant to violent thunderstorms with strong winds and lightning. But first, Well, 
as we approach spring forecasters across the nation turn to the Storm Prediction Center, the authority on severe weather across the United States. I had the chance to talk with one of the meteorologists there about the upcoming season and how severe forecasting can still be quite challenging. This may be the hub for forecasting in central Pennsylvania, but this is the hub for forecasting severe weather across the continental United States. It's the Storm Prediction Center in Norman, Oklahoma. I had the chance to talk with one of their senior meteorologists via Skype about severe weather forecasting and the upcoming season. Uh, but our primary objective is to highlight those areas most at risk for severe thunderstorms. And when we talk about severe thunderstorms, we're talking storms with high winds, large hail, and tornadoes. Greg Carbon is a senior meteorologist with the SPC, and he says severe weather forecasting has come a long way with new technologies and continues to evolve. We're beginning to see computer models actually simulate um, thunderstorms. So these new tools are always coming out. Um, meteorologists are tasked with trying to digest an enormous amount of information over a very short period of time. Part of that process is identifying four main atmospheric ingredients necessary for severe thunderstorms. Moisture, lift, instability, and wind shear. That's what's needed for a decent large-scale severe event. But how can we better predict when all these factors will interact in that perfect way? Carbon explains. And we have some forecast models now that are doing a pretty decent job at the global uh, circulation. And they may have some promise, perhaps a week or two out, and maybe they'd be even uh, able to extend the, the, the capability of us looking at the severe storm environment, some of those ingredients we just talked about for outbreaks, maybe even a month or maybe, maybe beyond that, 60, 90 days out, try to begin to anticipate when the environment might become favorable for more larger severe weather outbreaks. That's coming towards us, guys. Specific to tornado forecasting, Carbon says that no matter how advanced our tools become, such micro-scale storms are difficult to predict. When you look at the advances that we've made just in recent years with the use of uh, high-resolution models, you still have to realize, though, that, you know, you have to be humble. Uh, the atmosphere can still throw some, you know, curveballs at you once in a while. Storm Spotter did uh, see a funnel cloud in terms of our local outlook for this season, it's tough to say, but there are some certainties in forecasting. We know when, when it starts to pick up, and uh, that'll be into April and, and May and even into June. Uh, those are the months when you know we'll probably see some, some organized, uh, widespread severe weather events occur because that's when they've occurred in the past. This season, our commitment remains the same, to try our best to warn you of impending severe weather well ahead of time and it's getting easier. The science of meteorology seems like it's, it's moving forward at, at rapid pace and, and shows no sign of, of uh, letting up. So, uh, you know, it's an exciting time to be a meteorologist, as I'm sure you're aware. Well, we are certainly aware of that here in the Storm Track Center, and uh, we will keep you posted as severe season 2013 uh, unfolds. All right, after the break, he's at it again. Grab the popcorn because meteorologist Dan Tomaso is about to go in depth into the science of severe thunderstorm development. Stay with us. So intense there. It's only it's a matter every time. That's right. <laughs> it's only a matter of weeks now until severe thunderstorms start popping up here in central PA. It seems each round of storms is often different than the last. Yeah, some storms develop all alone while others move in a line. Some even become tornadic. So just how does a day go from sun to storm? It's time for Dan to get sciencey. It's a typical warm spring or summer day with plenty of sunshine and warming conditions. Radiation from the sun warms the air near the ground, creating a density difference between that air and the air immediately above it. Since air near the ground becomes less dense as it warms, air bubbles start to rise. As air bubbles rise, they begin to cool and condense. This process creates clouds and sometimes showers and thunderstorms. But not every air bubble condenses into cloud formation, and this is why we can have very scattered pop-up showers and thunderstorms in summer afternoons. Precipitation then begins to fall and evaporate. This cooling as the water evaporates actually takes place as the rain reaches the surface. The colder air generated from the rain now creates a cold pool of air that is more dense than the surrounding air. The cold air sinks and spreads out near the ground. 
and the edges of the cold pool can actually generate more lifting aloft. So not only do we have the updrafts that I just talked about, but we also have lifting along the edges of the cold pool, promoting more in the way of updrafts. These updrafts of rising air then interact with wind shear aloft. Wind shear can come in two different forms. The wind speed itself can change with height as seen here. The winds are actually stronger up above our heads than near the ground, but also the direction of the wind can change with height. And a combination of the winds change with speed and direction with height is generally the case, especially during thunderstorm cases. In fact, here's an example of that where we have low level winds that are from the south and then stronger westerly winds aloft. This will actually create turning in the atmosphere or also rotation. Now, weak wind shear allows for single cell thunderstorms to form, while stronger wind shear creates a multicellular storm. Single and multi cell thunderstorms are the most common storm types here in central Pennsylvania. Single cells are also termed pulse thunderstorms because they generally don't last too long and they don't really create a whole lot of damage. However, multicellular storms can create flooding as storms tend to impact the same areas for long periods of time with heavy rain. Strong deep wind shear also promotes supercell thunderstorm development. These are the strongest thunderstorm type. Updrafts within a supercell can tilt, and these rotating columns of air can create what is known as a mesocyclone or a large area of rotating air. The tilted updrafts continue to feed the storm, oftentimes creating severe weather with strong winds, frequent lightning, and hail. Mesocyclones can also be indicative of a tornado, but they don't necessarily have to create tornadoes. In fact, that's one of the big forecasting problems with actually figuring out if tornadoes will form. From Beyond the Forecast, I'm meteorologist Dan Tommaso. Hopefully, you're a little more severe weather savvy. Now I'm convinced some of you are going to have to hit the pause button on the DVR, go back and watch that a couple times to really take it all in. But thank you, Dan, for that. Up next, we hit the road to Millersville, a well-known school of meteorology right here in the Mid-State. And later, Brett and I answer your questions, big and small, common or obscure, in a lightning round of Ask the Weather Guys. You're watching Beyond the Forecast, Severe Season 2013. Welcome back. Well, as you know, living here in the Commonwealth, we get to experience all four seasons and all sorts of weather patterns. So what better place for a university to offer a meteorology degree than right here at home? That's the case at Millersville University, where the program seems to be growing in popularity among prospective students. In the heart of Lancaster County, the meteorology program at Millersville University continues to grow around a hands-on approach. A big part of their learning occurs outside of the classroom. It's experiencing the weather, seeing the, the flow of data, the, the models coming in, seeing the storms develop and evolve, and that's what happens here in the Weather Center. Uh, the students can come in in the evening and study and track storms, and you know when there's a, a big event underway, they'll be here all night. It's very challenging at times, but you come through these courses knowing an incredible amount of meteorology, the ins and outs, the mathematical equations behind everything. In addition to all the equipment and forecast models that they have inside, it's important for the meteorology students to step outside onto the weather deck here at Millersville and experience the weather they're forecasting. So we felt when we, de when we designed this building about a decade ago, we wanted an observation deck that we could right here flow out side and look at developing thunderstorms or see the snow beginning uh, or, or, and look at the, the texture of the flakes. And that tells you something about the atmosphere up in the clouds. Weather Center Director Eric Hurst says the department even runs their own forecast model, helping to predict the weather right here in the mid-state. So what about that increased frequency of tornadoes across Lancaster and York counties that Eric Finkenbinder talked about earlier in the show? There is almost kind of a mini tornado alley down here in southeastern PA, York and Lancaster County, up across the river uh, towards uh, uh, Lebanon County and even over towards Chester and Berks County. If you look at 30 years of tornado data and plot it for the entire state, you'll see there's a maximum in western Pennsylvania near the Ohio border and there's a secondary maximum here in the lower Susquehanna Valley. One reason sometimes tossed around, tornadoes and hills don't get along. It is a myth that tornadoes don't form in hilly areas. We know that is the case. Um, 25 years ago, there was an F5 tornado, a very rare tornado that went right through central Pennsylvania, through Black Machan and Forest, and tracked up and down over the mountains. So we can set that myth aside. Instead, he says it's centered on the moisture-rich, sometimes even muggy air that can move up from the Chesapeake Bay to that part of the Commonwealth. It's nothing like the tornado alley. 
in the plains, of course, where there's hundreds of tornadoes a year. But uh, in, in a state as large as uh, Pennsylvania, you, there's a little higher likelihood down here uh, in our neck of the woods than there is, say, in State College. And in the cards for this season? You know, this year, if you're going to bet, you know, um, climatology is always the safest way to go because there is no strong signal when it comes to uh, forecasting months in advance uh, what type of uh, season you're going to have. Now, of course, I being an Oswego student, you guys were all Penn State. I don't want to forget mm -hmm. about Penn State. I just yeah. had to give a little love to Millersville. That was well. great. Uh, what a great piece. Very interesting. Yeah, we so. had a great time down there. Now, after the break, viewer questions put the two of us to the test. Nothing is off limits. All subjects on the table. All right, maybe politics off limits. <laughs> That's true. And we'll preview what we're cooking up for our next Beyond the Forecast. But first, here's one last trivia question to test your knowledge of Pennsylvania meteorology. fun there with That's our bobbleheads. Right. Well, yeah. it is time to ask the uh, weather guys. Now, we, we opened this up on social media. Hopefully you had a chance to get onto Facebook, Twitter, the whole nine yards. And we don't necessarily know what questions are coming our way here. Our producer upstairs, Aaron, she is going to take care of that. That's right. Put them up back behind us here and uh, All right, let's go well, from there. Let's get to the first question here. If you could pick anywhere in the U.S. to live for the best weather, where would that be? And please, San Diego is out. Yes, so, sir. Ryan, you want to take this first? You know, it all depends on what your definition of best weather is. I personally, as you probably know, I'm a snow guy. So I would have to say I'd be going up north probably. For some reason, I like Boston. You know, they okay. get the nor'easters, but they also get that nice... Let's say mild summer, not they a do. hot summer. They How about do. you? Well, I, I'm going to have to cop out here and say right here because I've grown up here and I like the four seasons. We have fall, we have winter, although not recently. I know well, you're frustrated yeah. by that. <laughs> but we get, do get active weather in the summer too with severe seasons. So yeah. I like the weather here because it is a variety and we're always on our toes. I go on school visits all the time. That's what I always tell the kids is, right. hey, we, we get it all. We get <laughs> all right. four. You got it. All right, next question. Ryan, take this one here. Here we go. What effects do solar flares have on the weather? I know a lot of people may have been hearing about this, and, and that's, a, that's a good question to ask. You know, the sun is a good part and a major part of our, of our forecast and how it affects the weather, but, mm -hmm. uh, you know, how would you put it? How well, you... I think ultimately that the sun is the biggest driver of climate, so solar flares do have an effect on our climate, but I think, you know, we're not solar scientists. I think there are specific people that study that type of thing, and they have said, yes, they are affecting our weather on a day-to-day -day basis, probably not so much. Yeah. 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 All right, That's one more. Time. Let's uh, see. Do we have the next one here? How much money do you make before taxes? We did say <laughs> anything was on the table. I don't know here. Maybe the smart answer is not enough, but uh, I don't think that's true. Yeah, let's I put think, it that way. I think, yeah, I, think, I think the thing of it is, you know, it's like you find something you love to do and you have somebody pay you for it. And I think that's what all four of us have done here. Yeah, right? we, get, we get to have fun with our job, but also we get serious when we have to. And that's right. Oh, so that was a cop out again, but we'll <laughs> do it. Course. We'll do it. All right. Well, our next show is coming up. That is going to premiere in June, just in time for the Atlantic hurricane season. Hurricane season runs from June 1st through November 30th, and we will take you inside tropical cyclones. We'll talk to experts about how these storms form, whether or not they are getting more intense, and also take a look back at how tropical storms or remnants from them have affected central Pennsylvania over the years, which I'm sure a lot of you can remember. We'll also preview this coming season's hurricane outlook and go over those ever popular 2013 tropical cyclone names. That's all coming up June 4th in about three months at 7:30 on Beyond the Forecast Inside Tropical cyclones. And remember, if you missed any part of this show, we will be re-airing it all week long on Storm Track Center 24-7 channel. Tune in at 8 o'clock each night to catch an encore presentation of Beyond the Forecast Severe Season 2013. Check your local cable subscribers here for your channel listing. And if you don't get cable, you can always watch our Storm Track Center 24-7 channel live over the internet. Just click on Live Weather on our homepage. Well, thanks for joining us. Uh, yeah. That's it. That's, uh, that's the end. We hope you enjoyed the program, and have a great night, and of course, stay safe this severe weather season. We'll see you next time.